All right, so we will go over our agenda here. Um, so we will start off with a um, for our review. We'll do for our benefits. We'll do uh, for our best management practices uh, for our research and the differences between the designation and certification uh, programs. And then we'll have a, a panel discussion afterwards. Um, and then also just want to introduce our panel today. Um, so we do have Tom Brosma, who's Chief Scientist with Plant Nutrition Canada, Dale Cowan, Agronomy uh, Strategy Manager and Senior Agronomist with Egris and Winstead Farms Cooperatives, Lynn and Paul Warner from Warner Egg, um, Aaron Stravinitz, if I said that correct, incorrectly, I apologize, Aaron, uh, Technical Sales Manager, Eastern Canada uh, and the Mosaic Company. Uh, and from here, we'll uh, pass it over to Tom. He will start with uh, the review of foreign nutrient stewardship. Thank you very much, Brittany, and thank you to all for uh, joining in this call. It's uh, indeed a privilege to lead off today's session with uh, these um, great industry leaders who are indeed making for our more sustainable than you think. Uh, Aaron, uh, Lynn and Paul and Dale will be telling you what's happening in terms of the uh, boots on the ground. Their efforts have contributed a lot to make, uh, to, to put for our where it is today. I'm speaking to you today from Guelph, Ontario, um, where uh, I've been working for the past 25 years in supporting the nutrient stewardship efforts of uh, the fertilizer industry. What I want to do is review some of the basic concepts of 4R and the uh, programs that are supporting it in Canada. As we see on this slide, sustainability has three legs, economic, social, and in, uh, environmental. And the three legs need to be balanced. The practices that producers select or develop are based on science, uh, but they differ from farm to farm as they need to be adapted to the specific cropping system to the specific farming operation in order to make that contribution, that balanced contribution to those three legs of sustainability. 4R has four components, the source, the rate, and time and place of nutrient application. They all need to be right together and they have large impacts not only on the nutrient use efficiency of the crop, the crop yield, and, but also on the environmental impact. And a final principle of sustainability includes measuring and evaluating results to adjust practices. In other words, an adaptive style of management. It's not just thinking about source, rate, time, and place. It's about thinking how those four contribute to a more sustainable system for your farm. Maybe you too are more sustainable than you think. Let me go to the next slide there, Brittany. 4R can improve all three components of sustainability. It improves environmental outcomes, but it's more than just an environmental program. Getting more nutrients into the crop and losing less benefits society and benefits farmer profits as well. The environmental benefits relate mostly to nitrogen and phosphorus. First, controlling the movement of these two nutrients into surface waters limits harm to water quality. It limits nitrate issues in drink, drinking water. It limits their impacts, the general impacts on biodiversity through the eutrophication of the environment. Second, it limits the emission of nitrous oxide, which is a big factor in the carbon footprint of farming. And third, it lo limits losses of ammonia that could potentially harm the quality of the air. So it's not just by controlling rate, the source, timing, and placement of nutrient application have big direct effects on these loss pathways as well. The social benefits derive from both the environmental and the economic, and they include less impact of food production on climate change, better water quality, and safe, nutritious, and abundant food. Economically, for our practices improve the return on the fertilizer dollar. They help ensure supply chain access, meeting sustainability requirements, and they result in economically viable farms. When we get specific about practices, not every practice suits every farm. These are 10 examples 
that have been shown through research that at least in certain situations provide both an environmental and an economic benefit to the farm. For example, banding nitrogen close to the seed row, it's very useful in Western Canada. And it relates very much to number two. Uh, it's commonly practiced and shown to uh, re reduce the, uh, the total need for nitrogen for uh, most of the cereal crops that they seed, and at the same time, reduce nitrous oxide emissions. When you go to number three, split application of sulfur was shown to be very important in Alberta, where sulfur was limiting yields of crops. If you are meeting a, a need for a nutrient other than nitrogen and phosphorus, you're often improving the uh, use efficiency of those nutrients and reducing then environmental impact per unit of crop, crop production. Number four, getting phosphorus into the soil. That one has been shown both in Saskatchewan and Ontario to reduce losses of dissolved phosphate from the soil. Number five, applying nitrification inhibitors. That uh, research has been shown in many places in, uh, across Canada and many places around the world to reduce the emissions of nitrous oxide very effectively for any ammonium uh, supplying nitrogen fertilizer. Applying urea at planting, number six, um, <clears throat> is, is a great practice for uh, both Western Canada and Eastern Canada, and limits as well the um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Number seven and number eight, if you take them too literally, we don't apply inhibitors directly to the plant, we don't apply them directly to the soil, but if you're applying urea or UAN at the eighth leaf stage in corn, and you use an inhibitor, um, Claudia Wagner Riddle's re research certainly showed a reduction in nitrous oxide emissions and yields as good or better. Applying um, inhibitors, nitrification inhibitors, even when the urea is um, incorporated into the soil, it still has a benefit in terms of uh, limiting uh, nitrous oxide emissions. The inhibitors of, uh, ammo of urease also limit the ammonia emissions. Subsurface banding phosphorus has been shown to be beneficial in cutting loss of uh, dissolved phosphate in Ontario and many other places as well, and is a particularly important practice for protecting Lake Erie. Optimizing the split application of nitrogen <coughs> is, a, is, a, is a practice that's very practical for sandy soils not as much as clay, but uh, certainly shown in Prince Edward Island to uh, be uh, very beneficial for potato production there. So any of these 10 practices can be right or wrong for your specific crop. Making the choices can be hard, and so, which is a good reason why uh, getting the advice from a certified professional is worthwhile in working on your 4R program for your farm. And a big question arises, how do we know what's right when what's right is site specific? Is 4R an anything goes philosophy? And I would say not at all. And we've attempted to bring consistency to the program by uh, pr producing guidance documents and also setting standards. The guidance document shown here is one that's uh, been developed for Canadian cropping systems. And it includes tables for very specific crops in Western Canada and Eastern Canada as well. It provides definition and description for what constitutes a 4R practice for a given crop in a given region. And it's very consistent with, but it's not quite as pres prescriptive as the standards for the Ontario 4R certification program, which I'll be talking about as we move on. So for example, here are the basic level practices for nitrogen use in Ontario corn soybean cropping systems. In contrast to Western Canada, we only fall apply nitrogen if it's associated with a phosphate that might be fall, uh, fall applied. And we require inoculation of soybean. We set rates field specifically using either a nitrogen balance or an, an OMAFRA guidelines calculators. No application on frozen or snow covered soil. Right place is in the soil. 
when, uh, whenever it's not applied as a top dress to a, to a living crop. So very <clears throat> succinctly given guidelines here. Um, they, uh, they aren't legalistic. They're spelled out in more detail when we get, go to the certification programs. Next slide shows some uh, for our practices for Ontario winter wheat. And uh, I'm going to skip the detail here, but this is just to show the point that uh, the, there are practices described in these tables for different crops, different regions, and there's a different, there are um, levels as well, the basic level, intermediate and advanced. Uh, so we're, we're trying to design a system that encourages uh, continuous improvement uh, as well. So we ask ourselves, what are farmers actually doing? And uh, certainly a sustainability principle is that we need to be documenting uh, what we're doing and being able to, uh, being accountable essentially to the public. And the next slide is going to show an example from a recent survey conducted by Stratus Ag. Um, this, these are 2019 results and this survey is going on in 2020 as well. What I'm showing here, this is a lot of detail. You may not be able to see the full detail on your screen, but uh, <clears throat> we've got uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur uh, on corn. This is showing the placement um, by various timings. And what we see here in the fall, we're applying very little nitrogen um, on corn in Ontario, which is a good thing. We don't uh, intend to apply much. This is by fertilizer volume, by the way. You can see that the major um, <clears throat> method of applying uh, nitrogen fertilizer in corn in Ontario is uh, subsurface banding side dress in, uh, uh, after planting. <clears throat> and for phosphate, what we see the major method of application, we've got about 40% of the phosphate going down as a band at planting, which is the recommended practice for reducing uh, uh, phosphate loss <clears throat> uh, to, to Lake Erie. We do have a small amount that's applied in the fall. That's not necessarily a problem unless it's broadcast on the surface with no incorporation. We do have 8% there. Uh, that likely should be changed if it's done for corn uh, we, and eliminated altogether. If, if it's done on land that's highly susceptible to runoff, that could still be a problem. So we have a great deal of detail in a survey like this, and uh, that's very uh, useful for um, us to uh, be reporting what we're doing in terms of a program uh, for <clears throat> uh, environmental and um, economic issues in <clears throat> associated with nutrient use. The next couple slides, I'll uh, just show a little bit about our research network. Uh, as I've mentioned, the practices, uh, to recommend them, you have to have good science indicating that they're indeed effective for what they do. And we've worked with a network that includes at least these nine individuals across Canada. And uh, if I can show the next slide, <clears throat> um, there have been a number of practices funded since 2013 through a 4R research fund, a fund to which all um, many members of the fertilizer industry have been contributing uh, for the past uh, seven years or so. I'm not going to go into detail on any of these projects, but uh, many of these individuals are those who have uh, uh, put together results that support the practices that I was just discussing. Can I have the next slide and then the next one as well? <clears throat> Uh, you can find a lot more detail at, uh, in these two publications put out by Fertilizer Canada. Uh, they're available online on the web for free and they contain an enormous amount of detail um, on the projects uh, that have been uh, conducted by these researchers and, uh, and published as well. On the next slide, I will uh, give a little bit of a comparison here of some of the programs across Canada. Next slide, please, uh, Brittany. Yeah, thank you, this is the one. Uh, we've got four hour programs for retailers and also for crop advisors across Canada. And uh, oh, the four hour designation program is one that's relevant to Western Canada. Uh, um, it's run, uh, <clears throat> it, it can be available anywhere in Canada, but um, agronomists essentially attest to their competence in four hour and they become 4R designated by four, following 4R principles and then by tracking their customers in terms of um, 
the tracking the number of 4R acres. The certification program is a little higher level of rigor. It involves third party certification. Um, it's, uh, there are programs in both Ontario and Prince Edward Island. It's a higher level of commitment because it requires a lot of record keeping and proof that you're actually, uh, as a dealer, all the recommendations that you make and the application, the fertilizer applications that you make are indeed um, consistent with 4R principles. This program has been rolled out since 2018 uh, with an initial focus on the Lake Erie Basin. It's very similar in structure to a program on the other side of the border uh, that was rolled out in 2014 in Ohio covering the Western Lake Erie watershed. In the past few years as well, over the past four years, a, a nutrient management specialty certification credential to a certified crop advisor who already knew a fair bit about uh, nutrient management and uh, soil and water quality. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge exam based um, program and uh, it's available in both Ontario and the prairies. So you can see across Canada we have a number of programs here uh, tailored to uh, the needs for the environment. The, you might ask why go to third party certification and why would a farmer go to a retailer certified in 4R? The main reason is in this picture here. We're seeing recurrent and increasing algal blooms in the western end of Lake Erie and sometimes spreading right through the whole lake. The lake is something that each of us are, is concerned about. <clears throat> uh, whether we're farming or whether we're in business, or whether we're just somebody living in uh, this, the whole area of this circle here. Um, everyone wants a lake in which they can fish and they can swim and obtain their drinking water if needed. And we see the green uh, in the western basin here. If you look a little more closely from the mouth of the Thames to, uh, to the uh, inlet for the Detroit River, you'll see a slight stream of green there as well. Algal blooms are an issue and that they're driven by nutrients contained in the river, and the nutrients contained in the river are affected by the land from which it drains, um, the, the land to which we're applying nutrients. The volume of nutrients we use in agriculture is huge compared to the small amount that leaks into the lake and stimulates an algal bloom. And for, for this reason, we need to be showing more care on the, on the way we manage nutrients. The source rate, time, and place are all, ex, are, are all very uh, relevant. Uh, the, these four R's can limit the losses and we need to just demonstrate confidently to the public that we're doing four R, not just talking about it. Uh, one example is uh, I was involved with the Nomafra Agricultural Sector Working Group that's been meeting for the last five years or so to deal with targets that are required by the Canada-US Water Quality Agreement uh, and so far they're keenly watching the success of this voluntary four R program and the government as well is hoping that uh, this program will be successful and avoid the need for anything more restrictive in terms of regulation. So those are the main points I wanted to make here. Uh, 4R is a, is a program that's designed to address not only Lake Erie water quality, it's uh, designed to address um, all sustainability and uh, environmental issues. Uh, according to their level of priority in the region where we work. Um, from here in, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Brittany and uh, to, to lead the uh, panel discussion and, uh, and hear from um, <coughs> our practitioners. Okay, thanks Tom. It's actually uh, Kelsey, Hill. Kelsey Hill here. I'm the Nutrient Stewardship Coordinator with Fertilizer Canada. And I'm just gonna kind of go through our panel that we have today. Um, and help them with a few questions we have to try and highlight their benefits and their time spent on the 4R project. Um, so first off, we have a few um, kind of basic questions to help introduce everyone. So I'm going to ask everyone, how long have you been involved with the 4Rs? What first drew you in? And why are they important to you? So if um, Dale wants to start us off answering those two, that'd be great. Well, I'll unmute myself here. Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, so uh, it's a couple good questions. So how long have you been involved in 4Rs? I would say my whole career, which spans 40 years, but 
uh, we've done all aspects of this, but right now having a formalized program, I'd say within the last 10, 15 years when things have become more formalized, I've been involved with it and certainly have been an active participant in the technical committee for, uh, for our Ontario. So uh, that's uh, that first drew me into it was just the idea of being, uh, being technically competent and being able to help farmers. And, and as Tom has alluded to, uh, it's a very uh, knowledge intensive business and having the opportunity to, to bring that knowledge to bear on some of our customers' farms. So that's uh, what appeals to me is being able to help customers. And uh, why is important to me? Well, I, uh, I like the aspect of the program being a structured program that's science-based with best management practices. Uh, it can be very site-specific and challenging. And the four R's themselves are easy to say, a source rate, time, and place. But I, I believe that uh, it's very knowledge intensive to implement. And that's the challenge on, on farms today is to be able to understand what's happening and apply the principles appropriately. So I enjoy that part. Uh, I'm also a certified crop advisor and have been since 1994, so 26 years being a crop advisor. And I find the whole integration of the 4R principles on nutrient stewardship, sustainability, and being a CCA, that fosters and supports a whole process of uh, lifelong learning, which appeals to me, keeps me engaged, keeps me motivated, and keeps me young, which I need all the help I can get at that point. So, so thank you, uh, Kelsey, for that. Awesome. Thanks, Dale. Um, Aaron, would you like to go through the next uh, questions? Sure, just also unmute myself. Absolutely, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, I'll uh, I kind of wear two hats when it comes to uh, to these questions. One is uh, farming. Uh, myself, we uh, my family uh, farms on a small farm out in Bloomingdale, Ontario, which is on the other side of the river from Kitchener Waterloo, and then also from my career standpoint, being the technical sales manager for Mosaic. Um, so. How long have I been involved with the four R's? Um, I'll start with the farm side of things. Um, our farm, as I mentioned, on the other side of the river of, of Waterloo. So the, we farm in the Grand River watershed. The Grand River is uh, right along the border of our farm. So ever since the beginning of um, essentially helping my, my family make decisions on our farm, which has been about 15 years now, um, the whole four R mindset has been top of mind. Um, we've really looked at it from a, from a good land steward uh, aspect. So, you know, being a steward of the land not only means making good decisions for return on investment, but also the environmental impact. Um, because if you think of it as, if we're not taking care of the environment and keeping the environment clean long term, we don't have a productive uh, environment to grow the food we need, that the world needs to grow and eat. And uh, we really want our farming practices to evolve and adapt. So, when I think of that, I want my, not only our farm as it has during the years evolve and adapt to our changes and, and the science that comes down on how do we do adapt uh, to keep our environment protected, but also to have my children foster those ideas as well. So they understand when they maybe take over the farm if they choose to do so, that they can adapt uh, practices like 4R or whatever comes next to ensure that our environment is safe. Because if we don't have a healthy environment to grow our crops in, um, that's not a very long-term uh, way to look at food production. And once again, looking at the four R um, principles, it's really the core of that. Um, from, from my career, I've just started with Mosaic. I've been in the, uh, with Mosaic for just about a year now. And uh, really career-wise have focused, uh, but previously I was in the seed industry. And so I was, a little bit in touch with the four R's and obviously knew all the practices, but now being uh, actually in the fertility business, it's obviously the core of, of what I do and actually a lot of the decisions and, and training that I do in my job. Um, and a trip for R's is a part of the training that I do as on behalf of Mosaic to our customers. Um, four R's has been a part of Mosaic um, essentially from the beginning, but looking at it specifically when we were involved in the four R program, it's been about a decade. Um, and uh, it's really been adapted to our identity as a company because uh, we have partnerships all the way across North America. Um, when you look at for 4 our stewardship and why it's important um, to me or to a mosaic, it, it really comes down to something very simple. It's just the right thing to do. Um, from a 40,000 uh, foot view, it can be sim sim um, just essentially summed up by, by two factors and that's the need to be profitable and the focus on the environment. And if you look at the four R's, that right source, right rate, right time and right place, 
that whole model really does focus in on that profitability and environmental stewardship perfectly. Uh, it just uh, melds all of them together. And uh, that's why I think it's, uh, it's very important uh, for growers and for, uh, for retailers and producers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. And finally, if Lynn and Paul, if you could wrap us up with those two questions. Okay, um, I'll start with our involvement with 4Rs. So our family farm is on the north shore of Lake Erie. So we have been trying to implement uh, best management practices for several years. We watched keenly when, and I think it was 2014, when Ohio rolled out their 4R program and tried to implement some of the practices we were hearing about from them. In I think it was summer of 2016, our farm participated in the summer for our farm tour. And they were looking at then an experiment that we were trying regarding nitrogen. And then in 2018, uh, Paul and I and our Warner Ag business, uh, we took on the role of for our nutrient stewardship coaches for Ontario. And that involves helping the retail locations uh, prepare for the for our audit. And as far as why the four R's are important to us, as Lynn mentioned, our farm basically looks over the waters of Rondo Bay and Lake Erie, and we are very aware of the critical importance of that resource to our community. And we just want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can as farmers to help protect that resource. And then also, I guess a little more selfishly, uh, we find that following the four R practices as farmers, helps our small land based cash crop farm to remain economically viable and profitable, which can be a challenge in today's farming landscape when you don't have a large land base with a cash crop farm. And then in our role as certified crop advisors, we want to make sure that we're always providing our clients with the absolute best recommendations for their farms. And we know that making sure that our recommendations regarding nutrient applications as long as they follow for our principles, that we are providing that best advice possible to our client customers. That's great. Um, uh, so we just have a few kind of more specific questions. And um, this one I'm gonna kind of focus more towards Lynn and Paul, but if anyone else afterwards has some comments they'd like to add, feel free. But um, what are some of the key educational places you have learned about the four R's? Is there any you would recommend to a producer or an agronomist looking to learn more? So some of the ones that we've kind of wrote down and have used through our coaching practices, the Fertilizer Canada website in their e-learning center has a good short course on, this is very general, would be good for producers or anyone entering into the ag retail industry. And it's just a good introduction to what the four R's mean and some of the general best management practices. There are also, I think there's three in total. One is a very introductory and then there's two other um, short courses that you can do through those and those are all very good introductory level. Uh, as a producer too, you can also search out those Ontario retail locations that have become certified and ask questions there. So they are certified locations, so they have people on staff that are very versed in what the 4R best management practices are and they will be a good resource for you. For agronomists, uh, the certified crop advisor for our designation is an excellent way to get more in-depth and learn more details about the 4Rs and how you can put them into practice in your agronomy business. And then finally, I would add, uh, it was mentioned, the 4R program is really a program of continuous improvement. And a great way is just to speak with other farmers about what practices they're implementing on their farms and have those discussions about things that you might be able to incorporate from other businesses that maybe would find a, a fit on your home farm. Awesome, that's great guys. Uh, so our next question we have, um, it's what future goals do you hope to achieve with the FAR program? Um, and I like the FAR program just with the multitude of goals you can achieve. And I think between obtaining acres, increasing yields. So I know Aaron, um, you have a family farm at home and you also wear the hat of working for Mosaic. So could you tell us some of the future goals you hope to achieve within the program? Sure, absolutely. So I might, uh, I might start from the Mosaic side of things. So as the, uh, the largest producer of finished phosphate and uh, potash products in the world, uh, we take the environment very seriously right from production um, to application of our products. 
And uh, really when it comes, when you nail it down to some core factors is just um, the, the importance that we've put on um, training and understanding where to apply these nutrients. And we, we really kind of sum it up in balanced crop nutrition. Um, so when you look at it, we have six uh, micro, macro, sorry, and uh, secondary nutrients and eight micronutrients. And then we also have uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, um, which are non-fertilizer elements. But those are really the, the uh, six, six and eight um, key factors in nutrition to the crop. And if we can deliver that uh, all within um, the same distribution and same uptake, that's really gonna help us uh, do a better job uh, to feed the, the crop and essentially take up what it needs. And sometimes we even seen efficiencies out of that by, by having a micronutrient distributed well and maybe not having to apply as much, um, then we can really reduce that application plus uh, increase our efficiencies of fertilizers. So I think uh, you know, that's a really good thing is a, an adoption of new products. And, uh, and as we look into our, our corporate um, kind of goals, we have an ESG uh, 2025 goals, um, which are environmental, social, governance uh, 2025 goals. And that's our, we want to achieve these goals by 2025. And I just picked two out of that, that, that really kind of focus in around the four R's and the importance to us as a company. Um, so the first is, uh, is empowering farmers in key growing areas, areas of North America to reduce the impact of crop nutrition productions on the environment by facilitating the implementation of 4R nutrient stewardship in North, Amer on, in North America for two, uh, 25 million acres by 2025. So really looking at that, once again, the 4R principles and using an actual nutrient stewardship, which we are adopting in Ontario and across Eastern Canada, through the 4Rs uh, certification to essentially apply nutrients in all those 4R practices. The second one is uh, promoting Mosaic's performance products as a part of our efforts to increase crop yields and, cont and contribute to key agricultural, agricultural outcomes, which is intensified productivity of agricultural lands, improved food security, and farmer prosperity, and achieving a 30% performance product uh, sales uh, increases 30% in our performance product sales as a share of total production of phosphate and potash crop nutrition tons by 2025. So I kind of alluded to that earlier. Uh, we have three performance products, Microessentials, Aspire, and KMAG, and uh, they all have fortified micronutrients or it's a whole bunch of nutrients um, fortified into one prill. So we have even distribution of a micronutrient. In KMAG, we have potassium, sulfur and magnesium all distributed very well. So it's really looking at that, once again, that efficiency of fertilizer and providing balanced crop nutrition so we can get better use out of our fertility and, uh, and through the four R's practices, um, reduce our environmental impact. Um, and obviously it, the increased adoption of acres, as I had mentioned earlier, and also really at the end of the day, the end goal is to improve drinking water and quality. Um, and we need agriculture to step up and be a part of that adoption and solution and come to the table so we can truly have, um, as, as that slide that Tom had earlier with uh, Lake Erie, we really want to reduce that. So we, we, can, we all want to fish, we all want to have clean water, and that's really our end goal. Um, from the farm side of things, I would say it, it really comes down to that increased profitability and yield. Um, and I do really think that the right source, right time, right rate, and right place is, is, very, is very important. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give a personal example. Um, so the right source. So we started uh, using our Mosaic Performance products on our own farm a couple of years ago. And, uh, and we've really found that that has really helped nutrient use efficiency and uh, just balance, through balanced crop nutrition. And on the side note on nitrogen split applying has really helped us reduce our rates because of the efficiencies and essentially keeping that the phosphates where they need to be in specific and same with nitrogen because of the timing. So the right rate is obviously we reduced some of our rates um, because of those efficiencies. The right time we applied in the spring in a two by two band and then uh, two time application of nitrogen. And, uh, and the right place is um, once again, two by two band. So we really have seen um, our fertilizer uh, bill is, uh, is definitely um, in check. And then we've seen our yields go up as well. Um, and the second part too would be a legacy. So I kind of mentioned it earlier, 
but uh, I'd like to see the legacy that my grandfather left on me, my father left on me. And uh, I hope to see that legacy continue on of the ability to farm with, with constantly learning. Um, Dale mentioned that earlier. I think it was perfect was, you know, part of being a CCA is forever learning. And uh, if we can keep learning new ways and new adoptions of technology to really drive not only profitability, but environmental stewardship, I think we're just going to continue to win um, in the pocketbook and to, through sustainability and keeping our environment clean. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so if we go to the next question here, um, it's what are the benefits you've achieved through implementing the forest at your retailer and or at your retail? And I know Dale, you've had a lot of experience with uh, getting the FARs into Agra. So would you be able to speak a bit on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, just bring up speed. So we are participating actively in the four R certification program in Ontario. So we have 10 retail locations, eight of them will be certified shortly and the remaining two by the end of the year. So we're committed to, to the process. So I think one of the benefits we've achieved or have seen when we start this process is we've definitely seen a shift in more demand for services. Soil sampling demand is going up because one of the criteria is to work with current soil tests no older than four years. So that's driven a lot of soil sampling, which leads to site-specific uh, recommendations, variable application services. We're seeing a very intense desire to collect data, to use the data that is collected on the various pieces of equipment, whether it's as applied or sprayer maps or using yield maps or even in-season satellite imagery to focus on scouting and looking for opportunities to manage in-crop in-season. A much uh, higher quality and better conversation with growers. We've been able to implement uh, more nitrogen stabilizers, probably half over half the nitrogen we, uh, we sell to our growers has a nitrogen stabilizer on it, probably close to 60% now. Uh, talk uh, intelligently about phosphorus placement and talk about nutrient stratific stratification, how that contributes to runoff and be able to, to change and modify practices and open the door to have those meaningful conversations that go beyond uh, simply talking about uh, rates and, and pricing of products. So we're actually talking about features and benefits of doing things better. Uh, focus on, on staff, on people, is what, what kind of uh, training and, and uh, skill sets will people need in the future to talk to farmers that are more goal oriented and they're looking for efficiencies and they're looking for effective relationships to help them meet their ROIs and their own sustainability programs. So what kind of skill sets are we going to put in our employees hands and, the, you know, the big focus on technology. Uh, getting very adept at uh, gathering and handling data, collaborating, cooperating, moving data, analyzing data, becoming analysts ourselves. So, so it, has, it has changed the whole landscape and the whole kind of conversation that we're having with our grower. And so to be effective with farmers, you wanna be able to implement, help them implement sustainability programs to build resiliency and weatherproof their farms. Uh, so it's, it's just opening the door to a different kind of business relationship with, with some key accounts and some keen customers that really want to do better. So I, I think, uh, you know, just helping our growers develop those enduring practices and meet their sustainability goals. I, I think that's what we're starting to see. Uh, those kind of changes taking place at retail where we are fully engaged with, with customers that really want to, uh, to do a better job of, of what they're doing right now. Great. Uh, thanks, Dale. That was awesome. Uh, the next question we have is, um, why would you encourage other farmers in Eastern Canada to incorporate the 4Rs into their current, current farming practices? And Aaron, I'm going to direct that one towards you. Um, that's a, it's a really good question. And uh, I think it comes back, I mean, it seems, sometimes I feel like I'm a broken record um, on this return to ROI and sustainability. Um, but it really, if you think about it from an ROI standpoint, if, if you sit down you know, Dale had uh, really summed it up well with, with targeting with, with someone who's for our certified and, and having that discussion and plan. And sometimes we have been over applying nutrients just because uh, um, we didn't have them at the right time in the right place. And if we're actually looking at coming up with a plan, your return on investment and, and use efficiency of those nutrients is going to be much more um, adaptable to your return on investment and bottom line. And you're going to probably drive more yields out of it. So your fertilizer bill may stay the same, but at the end of the day, you're getting more gains and more yield out of that fertility. And on the sustainability side, once again, it's just that keeping our environment um, it just clean and, and uh, having clean drinking water and making sure that we're keeping a sustainable environment to keep our long-term growth of food production so we can continue to 
feed the feed the world. And really a third one that I really want to talk about is the social license. And that's something that we just recently have started talking about. Um, but society is starting to ask us questions. And maybe um, in the agriculture industry, we haven't been a, done a great job of engaging in our, in our, in our customers, in our, the people that are eating the food that we produce. And uh, we need to do a better job at that. And I think for ours is a great step in the right direction, showing that we're coming to the table and we're, we're being efficient with our fertility application, using all the technologies that we've already used and partnering with good uh, industry people to show, essentially show uh, we are good environmental stewards. Being a steward of the land is important to us. And uh, that, you know, we have to, we have to do a better job of, uh, of communicating that to, uh, to our, our customers. And I think that's where 4Rs really comes into it. And I really think it's a good way and encourage farmers to take that first step and, uh, and really dive into the 4Rs and be able to tell that story. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so our next question is for Dale, and it's um, why would you encourage other retailers in Eastern Canada to incorporate the 4Rs? And I know we, you kind of touched on it earlier with your um, previous explanation, but uh, if you could uh, kind of go through that with us again uh, quickly. Yeah, so, well, certainly the, the reason I just give uh, should be a uh, pretty good incentive to carry on if you want to change the conversation. But I think there's another aspect to it. I'm going to use the term being a good corporate citizen. So I think uh, the idea, and Aaron's touched on it too, is the idea of, of being a leader in your community on sustainability conversations and linking with other players and other industries that are talking the same language. And uh, I had experience recently with some end users uh, with sustainability programs uh, reaching into the countryside to talk to farmers about their practices. And when I look at the questions that they have on their sustainability programs, they're all answered by the 37 audit standards in the 4R certification program for the province. So if we, we could probably do our farmers a great service if we want to be engaged in all those sustainability programs and be a conduit to help our customers qualify for some of those uh, those uh, higher value participations down the value chain is to simply have uh, being have that farm for our certified and simply comes a checkbox when the sustainability program comes to town and says, are you doing these things? Says, I have a for our certified farm. I work with a for our certified dealer. So it becomes a check mark that allows them to participate in a, in a value added uh, a program. So, so I think the whole other aspect of uh, being a good corporate citizen, leading the conversations in a community on sustainability, bringing your farmers in, bring other industry. And I, I think there's, uh, there's a chance there to have some overlap and some dialogue and, uh, and just be able to uh, reach out and let people know what, what agriculture is doing. On a, and I wanna make this point, on a voluntary basis, this whole thing is voluntary. And we have an opportunity here to showcase to everyone else just what we're capable of doing as an industry and as farmers to keep nutrients on, on our field. So I think it's important from that standpoint, that communication piece alone of being involved in, in 4R certification is, is, has a lot of pluses beyond just running our own businesses. Thanks, Kelsey. That was great, Dale. Um, I think you really hit the mark there. Uh, so this final question I have for Lynn and Paul, and um, what advice do you guys have for other farmers and retailers looking to get into the 4Rs and join the 4R certification path? First off, I would say you're probably already doing a lot of the things that are required to have your acres counted under Fertilizer Canada's designated program or to have your retail location certified as a 4-hour certified retailer. Uh, it's usually just a matter of documenting the practices that you already have in place as proof that that is what you are doing. And then secondly, while it is important to talk to other producers or other retailers about their 4 our practices and what they're doing to find what you can implement on your own farm or in your own retail location. Don't be intimidated by what others might be doing. Uh, the 4 our program is very uh, tailored to each individual farm. So it's, don't look at it as a program that, you know, is a, a far flung thing that's very difficult to achieve. There are always small incremental steps that you can take on your own business that uh, will slowly over time move you towards your end goal. 
Great. That's awesome, Lynn and Paul. I think that really kind of gives some idea of, uh, I like the addition of, you probably already there, because I think um, a lot of people don't realize that it's not as hard as they think it would be to become forest, uh, forest certified. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions, make sure to add them to the question and answer box. I know Tom has answered one um, on not nitrous oxide emissions, differences between Eastern and Western Canada. Um, just to highlight, we will be having a Western Canada version of this webinar in um, November. Uh, but so anyone interested? Otherwise, I think we're kind of coming up to the end of the webinar. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. Um, I think we had a really good conversation um, on all of our uh, all of our um, four R's and how they have been interacting within Ontario. Um, on the slide now is myself, uh, the coordinator for our nutrient stewardship contact information, and Brittany Thibodeau's uh, communication specialist contact information. So, if you have any questions on the webinar, um, make sure to get in contact with us. Otherwise. Um, We'll have a recording of it available hopefully soon. And I'd like to thank everyone, Dale, Lynn, Paul, um, Brittany, Aaron, and Tom for participating today. But thanks everyone.